Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Austin, Texas. You've reached the Max Convexity channel. My name's Max, and I got a really good one for you today. The title of this speech is called, Austin, We Have a Problem, or Do We? Debunking the QQQI myth, Max debunks himself. All right, first to get started debunking myself, I need to talk about confirmation bias and echo chambers. So just to refresh everyone's uh, memory, confirmation bias is when our own predetermined biases affect our judgment in a negative manner. And I'm talking about my biases, not yours. And uh, it's not a compliment when somebody says you have confirmation bias. I think we all know what an echo chamber is. I got a, I got a note from one of my favorite subscribers, Mark. He said, each of your posts seem to be spot on with my analysis. Your channel has become my investing echo chamber. And I don't think he meant it in a bad way, but, but I started to think about it, and uh, I was thinking, I don't want to be an echo chamber. That's, that's not what I'm going for. Am I an echo chamber? It got me thinking. This was late Friday night, like about midnight Friday night. You know, to me, an echo chamber, the best way I could think of an echo chamber is like um, mainstream media, to me, is a big echo chamber. Not to pick on my sister. She's a lovely and intelligent woman but she watches MSNBC and Morning Joe. And, you know, that to me is an echo chamber. There's not going to be any new information on that channel. You're just going to get cheerleading and, and just going to get reinforcing beliefs that those people already believe. I'm not blaming Morning Joe for that my sister thinks the way she does because of Morning Joe. My sister's always been that way. I've known her the, her whole life. She, she is just attracted to Morning Joe, and other people are too, because it, it satisfies their, it pre-confirms, uh, it confirms some of their confirmation biases. I have a friend, just to be fair, I have a friend that's on the right end of the political spectrum, and I see the same problems with him. He, he gets a lot of his information, and it's an echo chamber. And I'm not trying to be political. Like I've mentioned before, I'm a, I'm a libertarian. I believe in you do you. As long as you aren't hurting anyone else, I'll do my thing, you do your thing. I think that's a great way to great way to be. But so the problem with social networks, and that would include YouTube channels like this one, is the algorithm puts you together with like-minded people in a very effective way, but maybe it's too effective sometimes. So I set out, uh, this is like I say, by midnight Friday night, I set out to try to debunk myself. I love this quote by Peter Drucker, what's measured improves. He was a famous business management consultant and author um, but he loved, he was into data-driven approaches, and, and so am I. So, uh, you know, I tried to, what I'm trying to do is get my emotions out of it. Emotions are your worst enemy, I think, lots of the times, not just in investing, but in investing particularly, they're, they're uh, you know, it's not something that helps you when you invest. I got another note uh, Friday night also. He said, thanks for the video. I own, I own shares of both JEPQ and QQQI, but on my radar, JEPQ is a much better and more stable fund. And I get letters like that four or five times a week. And, you know, and I like this subscriber. He makes a lot of other good points, too. So that got me thinking also, together with that and the letter I got from Mark, that's why I decided to debunk myself. So I got knee deep into research papers and these things are dry and boring, but I read them all so you guys don't have to. But what I wanted to do is I, if I found a research paper that confirmed something that I already thought, then I kind of discounted it and I specifically sought out the ones that, that triggered me, that, that disproved some of my pre-existing things. All right, so... First, I want to start with the stuff that's 100% correct. Most stuff that I said and think is and was uh, correct. You know, of course, I've been doing this my entire adult life, but it also it doesn't mean, just because I have experience, it doesn't mean that I'm always right. And, of course, risk and reward is one of the con fundamental laws of the universe to me. I don't know if it really is, but in my mind it is. So here's some of the truths. Um, the covered call strategies and short put strategies, first of all, they're the, exactly the same thing. They, they're functionally identical. Selling an, an in the money put, like QQQY does, is the same type of strategy as doing a, an out of the money covered call. They're, they're functionally the same. 
it is true that uh, that selling a put is opposite of selling a call, and that's where people get confused. And I understand, but uh, selling a put is the same thing as selling a call plus owning a synthetic or the stock. So in other words, the same thing as a covered call strategy. But for sure, they have lower standard deviation. There's no doubt about that. Less drawdown, better risk-adjusted performance. You know, they also have buffered downside and buffered upside. Please stop saying covered calls get all the downside. I see this all over the internet. That's not even close. How many days have you checked the price at the end of the day? The NASDAQ's down like a point and a half, and the QQQIs are only down a point. That half a point difference is, is a lot. That's 33% difference. That's, that's a bunch, and that adds up, and that compounds daily. They, they don't get all the downside, not even close. And look at on a longer-term perspective. That was a daily example I gave you, but on a longer-term perspective, look at 2009. 2009 was the worst market in my lifetime. And uh, the market was down 50%, but the covered call strategies were only down 32%. And that's a monthly covered call strategy on top. The middle graph is a weekly covered call strategy. And the weekly even does a better job at ensuring you, at, at preventing volatility. They were only down 24%. That's, that's awesome. And also look at the time in drawdown. On the bottom chart, it looks like you were in drawdown pretty much from 2008 to 2012 before you got your head above water. And the other charts, you, you know, you were still underwater a long time, but you, you got your head back above water a lot sooner. I see guys all the time on the internet. I saw one guy today. He said, they, he said, these things get uh, all the downside and none of the upside, so it's going to blow up. It's guaranteed to blow up. Well, well he, then he said, I, I'm not an options trader, though, but I understand math. Just with that one sentence, I understood that he doesn't understand options or math, and he hasn't looked at any studies. I bet he has some preconceived biases. I wanted to ask him, hey, did the, did the bad ETF hurt you or something? It just drives me crazy. Here's another way of looking at the same information. And here's a, but when they say they get none of the upside, well, have you seen Coney lately? Did you see TSLY in the first half of this year? They both got plenty of upside. Coney's up 20%. And of course, when they pay the dividend, it will go down to only being up 10%. But Coney's up 10% on NAV, and, t and they just paid a dividend that's more than 10%. That's, that's insane. I mean, don't tell Coney they get none of the upside. So Tesla is underperforming lately, but if you look back at the past year, Tesla's been doing great. The last month d does not make a year. Yes, the last month Tesla has had tracking error, but early in, earlier in the year, the first half of the year, it had positive tracking error. It had tracking error, good tracking error, the other way. So what's the deal? So everything's great, right? All we got to do is cover call strategies or short put strategies and cash our check. No problems, right? They're the greatest thing ever. Woohoo! Go cover calls, right? Well. Not quite. There are caveats, and I did find one or two things, so let me share that with you. The inconvenient truth is you really have to pay attention to the withdrawals and how they affect the NAV performance, i.e., do they cause additional tracking error? And the too long don't read is yes, they do, or they can. They don't have to, but they can. So here's the smoking gun study, and I'll post a link to it if you guys are interested in it, but basically what this study said, they, they looked at a 10-year period from 2006 to 2016, and uh, they, they're, they're, they tested different amounts, taking different amounts of distribution. In other words, they kept some of, the, some of the yield, they kept it in the fund and reinvested it, and they only paid themselves a part of it. Now, it says BXM. The BXM, that means that is an at the money and it's a monthly strategy. So this will be similar in, similar in construction to the XYLD. And on this study, they did find that, in fact, you can blow up a covered call strategy in these 10 years. They were a bad 10 years, 2006 through 2016. But those 10 years, you would have blown up had you not reinvested uh, part of your dividends. Um, and the amount they came up with to keep it straight, to keep your nav just straight across the board, would be 4.5%. Now, one of these kind of strategies makes 18 to about 22% if they paid all the dividends. 
So they're paying about a fourth of it. So according to the study, you can only pay yourself a fourth of the dividends if you're using a monthly at the money strategy. There was another, um, there was a, here's another one. You do a little bit better if you use, if you use an out of the money strategy. The BXY is a cover call strategy and it's also monthly, but it's where they go out of the money. And this is functionally the same thing as JEP E and JEP Q. And on this one, they could actually pay themselves a third of the dividends um, because they could pay 6% where they're making about 20, but they, they could pay themselves third, a third of it and keep the other two thirds rolling in the fund and not experience any net, net asset value, you know, depreciation across 10 years. Like I say, this study picked a really bad 10 years. 2006 was terrible. 2008 was terrible. 2010 and 11, we had flash crashes in 2012, I think. And we had a bunch, we also had the Greek, um, oh, the Greek banking crisis. And we, we had a bunch of stuff in that 10 years. But yes, you do need to reinvest dividends sometimes. That's what uh, Jay told us in the video with the coach. He, they were pressing him. I said, how do you keep from blowing up? And he said, well, the 100% insurer just reinvest the dividends. All right, so here's what, here's what else I figured out. So when I started looking at all these different uh, statistics and different white papers, then I decided, okay, well, I want to know what is optimum. What is the optimum strategy? According to all these 30 years of research, what is our best bet? Do we want an at the money? Do we want out of the money? Do we want to do monthly, weekly? You know, what do we want to do? Um, and of course, the monthly expiration cycle has been around the longest, uh, and, but it's also the least effect, effective at capturing yield. You know, the, the weeklies have been around not as long, but they're, they're much more effective at capturing, uh, capturing yield. And the dailies have just been around a couple of years. I think that's why there's really not any studies out here on the dailies yet, or not that I could find. All right, so let's talk about qualities that cause tracking error. In option strategy ETFs, there's two important qualities. There's the moneyness, which is out of the money or in the money. And then there's the time or the duration, or they call that the tenor. That's if it, if it uses monthly options, weekly options, or daily options. So just to recap, the moneyness is important because it, it's what causes your upside to be capped. Think of QYLD and XYLD. They use at the money, and because it's at the money instead of out, out, instead of, out of the money, we know they're going to capture less upside, and they know that too. That's just part of their plan. But the trade-off is they're also going to capture more income. So it's, it's a trade-off. Um, but in a, back to refresh on duration, a shorter duration is what gives you more income. A shorter duration makes you more effective at capturing income. It also makes you more effective at capping upside. So uh, the out-of-the-money funds are JEPQ and JEPI. At-the-money funds would be like QYLD, uh, RYLD. Then there's the monthly funds also that are, that are monthly and at-the-money, which would be XYLD and QYLD. Then there's monthly and out-of-the-money funds, which would be JEPQ and JEP, JEPI, but they all, there's not too many variations on them. Here's a nice infographic that I made that tries to, tries to help people visualize the shorter time frame you go, the better your, the more income you get, but the more track, the more tracking error you get. When you go on a longer time frame, you get less income, but you get less uh, tracking error, i.e. less upside capping. The weekly options are what uh, TSOI and Coney and all those are doing. So here's some more truths. Um, or here's the ultimate truth. You still have to reinvest two-thirds of your income according to the study. It, it doesn't matter time frame and all that kind of stuff. That, that helps cut down on tracking error, but you just need to reinvest two-thirds of your income. And the study quantized it. And I'm saying I'm not telling you to do that. I'm telling you the studies says to do that. So when I was looking at which one's optimum, uh, there's, these are, there's a couple of indexes. The BXM is an index the Chicago Board of Exchange uh, uses to track an at-the-money monthly call, cover call strategy. The BXMD is, is to track an out-of-the-money monthly cover call strategy. The BXMD is basically the same thing that JEPI and JEPQ is, and the BXM is the same thing as XYLD and QYLD. What I found out, look at this, the BXMD over 20 years was the top performer out of any of the variations of this. It almost beat just the S&P by itself. 10.7% annualized return, 
look at the standard deviation. It has about 80% of the deviation of the, I mean, 80% of the volatility of the S&P, but it gets all the income. I mean, that's, that's really big. So, you know, I started to look at all this and then I started to think, okay, well, what the guys over at JP Morgan did is they just made a fund that copies exactly what this does. But then they also probably saw that study that I showed you where they keep some of the money reinvested. And you put the two things together, and to me, that is that is the optimum outcome, according to the studies we have. There are no studies on dailies yet. When there are, I think the daily studies will be even better and everything. But as far as stuff that we can quantify, facts and figures, the J.P. Morgan guys, the monthly out of the money, that that that's probably the best. That's probably the best thing mathematically right now, according to the research I saw Friday night. So then I start thinking, maybe they do know what they're doing, or they obviously do know what they're doing. So this is when we got to talk about my preconceived biases. I've told you guys before I was in wealth management, and I worked for a smaller boutique firm, and we took very good care of our customers, and we charged them less than the big firms. I've always hated the big firms. They don't take proper care of you, at least they didn't in the 90s. I mean, in, unless you have an eight or nine figure net worth, you know, I, I just, so I had a preconceived bias against those types of funds and it affected my judgment a little bit and I certainly do apologize for it. Um, I I'll also say if anyone bought the QQQYs because I was so enthusiastic about it, um, I'm sorry, but I've only been doing this three weeks. QQQYs have been on fire. You're up. And if this, what you're hearing today and this, uh, and this study changes your mind, it won't be any problem just to sell them and get and get something else. You know, and I, I apologize. I apologize. Luckily, there's no commissions nowadays. So, you know, it, it won't cost you any money. But, you know, if in other words, let me just say this. If you do maximize upside capture more than anything else, yes, you'd be better off with JEPI or JEPQ. If you, but I'm also going to say if you do believe in maximizing income, I still think you'd be better with QQQY, and I'm going to tell you why. Even if you follow the study, the study says we have to put one, put two thirds of our money back into the fund, and we can only take one third of the money to spend. That on QQQYs, that would mean you have to reinvest forty percent, and you get to take take twenty percent home. But that twenty percent is free and clear. That twenty percent to me is a good comparison for the twelve percent of J.P. Morgan. Because the guys at J.P. Morgan, they also keep some of the money rolling in the fund, about half of it. So it's it's a good comparison. 20 is still more than 12. I'm sticking by what I say about QQQI, but there are caveats to it. So I, I want to do some factors on tracking error. And I, this is back to my data driven. I want to make a chart that really shows, no BS, where you get more tracking error and where you get less tracking error. And well, here's something else I thought too. If you're the kind of guy that's not very disciplined and you're going to get that big 60% check from QQQI and you're going to go buy a speedboat or something or, or spend it, you probably would be better off in JEPQ or JEPI because you don't have to worry about it. They invest, they, they keep some of the money for you and they only give you a portion of it. It's what you should be doing. They do it for you. So maybe there is some method to their madness. Um, but if you are a disciplined investor, you could you could take all the money yourself, but you have to be disciplined enough to know that you're going to have to put some of it back in, or you at least have to be willing to to reinvest some of it. Something else that drives me crazy about that study is the study's based on somebody that put all their money in at the start. They never added, you know, and of course, if you dollar cost average and stuff, a lot of these problems go away. You don't even have to worry about them. But I wanted to find the worst study I could find, and I was successful. That's a that was a um, pretty bad study. There's something else I discovered. If you want to, if you also want more growth, you could also look at look at this fund TYLG. I love this fund. It's only a half buy right, um, and they uh, the all the Global X they have all their funds. They also have a version where they only overwrite half of their portfolio. So that means that you would get more upside. Now the trade off is instead of paying 12 percent like their most of their funds pay, they only pay six percent. But if you're all right with that and you want and you want, you know, hella upside, nothing wrong with this, nothing wrong with these funds. I still prefer the other ones, but there's nothing wrong with these funds. I, I just want to be sure everyone understands that.
It is true, cover calls are badass, and they provide you all kinds of benefits. But the amount of withdrawals does matter, and what matters more than anything is my own biases. I think my own biases got in the way, and I do apologize. But I appreciate you guys watching this video, and I hope you guys have a wonderful what's left of your day. Thank you very much.